Ladies and gentlemen, we of opposition today are not going to argue to you about the merits of the beliefs or religions. We're not going to tell you that certain religious beliefs are good or bad, or that we should spread them more or spread them less. What we are going to tell you today is that the way in which the current religions spread or seek to spread their religion and practice or like preach it and spread their religion is ultimately harmful when they focus too much on this on, on, on the miracles, on the miraculous aspects of their beliefs. This undermines the ability of um, new believers uh, in trying to understand their beliefs as well as undermines their true acceptance of the life that they choose to lead when they decide, I want to become a, uh, a believer, I want to sign up um, to this church or to this mosque or whatever, right? What kind of religions are we talking about in today's debate? Very specifically, we often are talking about things such as like, um, Christianity or Islam. And within this, we are often especially talking about, like, say, evangelical groups or Pentecostal groups, right? These groups believe as a uh, talk about talk especially about like the miracles and focus on the miraculous aspects of their religion. And therefore they tell they don't tell you so much about like what you actually need to believe to come to this religion. They tell you like, look, this is a miracle that happened. This is a work of God. This is an act of God. That is why our God is here. That is why you should be, uh, become a believer. That is why you should believe in our God, right? Before I move on to explain the harms of this, yes sir? So we don't think that Pentecostal groups have no incentive to explain what the religion is about, but the main purpose of doing performing these miracles in the first place is to explain what religion is about. Yes, yeah, sir. So, we say that it is so we say that it is obviously in their interest to get people to understand their religious beliefs, right? But at the point where your pastors are telling them, why do you why do you like get only like five people to join our church or even none at all? And this is such a huge standard which is reinforced every week Sunday at like an evangelical church. This is what the this is the message is ultimately propagated to these believers, right? At the end of the day, even if they are not um, telling you that this is all our religion is about, this is the focus of, of their preaching, this is the focus of their evangelism, and this is why it is so harmful. I'm going to be telling you three things for today. First of all, I'm going to tell you how it distorts the understanding of religion. Second of all, I'm going to be discussing the responses of these um, non-believers to the um, to the kinds of um, to the kinds of preaching that is being put forward. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about harms that this proves. So first of all, we think that ultimately, right, this distorts an understanding really of what this religion really is about. When you tell people that, you know, um, that uh, there's this miracle that like maybe there was the flood and therefore my God exists, right? It seems to imply that this is all that your God really is about. Your God is there, your God is powerful because he creates worlds, not simply because he's like there in of itself, because of certain beliefs that your religion is trying to propagate, right? They overlook the aspect which ultimately tells you that you need to commit to a life of belief, you need to do uh, things like, for instance, like take up your cross, like bear suffering, right? Ultimately, for your religion, you need to commit every week, every day to going to church, to like doing quiet time or whatever. These are the kinds of real lives that you're opting into when you choose to accept a particular religion. You distort the understanding when you think that I'm just going to religion because then a God will work miracles for me somehow, because then I'll be chosen in that particular aspect, right? And that's why you think it's so harmful in distorting the understanding of religion. What has ultimately been the responses of non-believers towards such a rhetoric and preaching methods which have been as well? First of all, we see on one hand, there are some people who are like very skeptical, right? They are, they are like, oh, where's the scientific proof? So for instance, like my teammate knew that he's like non furiously because every time it, it's about where is there proof? This, it doesn't really happen. If not, like I'm not interested in your religion at all, right? The moment you start talking about miracles, this is harmful because you don't even get a chance to explain what that religion is about. There's no choice involved there. But more importantly, we're also talking about like the competition that exists, right? I mean, if one god like sends a flood and destroys the entire earth, and another god like sends like, I don't know fire that destroys the entire galaxy, surely this god that destroys the galaxy is more powerful and like somehow is better than the other god, right? And this is the kind of powerful competition that you think exists. This distorts the way in which they are really spreading their message. But at the end of the day, let us examine the expect when these people really actually enter the religion because of the shock and awe aspect of it, right? This is where we think that there are, there are various different sides. First of all, no thank you. We think that they are joining mostly because of like the immediate, the immediate shock and awe effect that's got to do with it, right? So for instance, if you tell them about a particular person that was just killed miraculously, they will think that, wow, this is really good and I'm going to like join your church, right? Because that's ultimately what, that's ultimately kind of pressure and message that is being put forward there. Instead of giving people the time to really consider, to find out more about their beliefs and to actually consider whether or not this is the kind of religion, these are the beliefs that are congruent with my value systems that I really believe in, that I want to commit my time life to, right? And at the end of the day, when they join the church, it is also about where are these miracles that like, I was promised, right? I 
join the church in PCE, if not explicitly, on the idea that God performs miracles, and therefore when I join this church, like he'll perform miracles for me. But more often than not, this is not what happens at the end of the day. Many of these preachers and pastors tell them, you know what, you just need to keep praying, you just need to keep believing, you need to trust in God, maybe he, like, he knows better than you, and that's the kind of message that happens at the end of the day. A few harms that we think accrue from all of this. On the first level, it's very hard for these people to actually recruit properly, which I explained already earlier. But more importantly, we also think that the kinds of people they recruit don't actually really understand or commit or believe to whatever you're talking about, right? And that is when they hold a moment, sir, when they ultimately like take the believer's pledge or the creed or whatever, then they don't actually understand what they are in for. Do we know the reason? Given that individuals interpret their religion differently and the church exposes these individuals to different tenets of religion, why can't individuals then interpret their own belief based on the miracles or based on other tenets of religion? So, so in a situation where a religion is entirely about miracles, like maybe that's not where the debate happens. The debate happens in the real world where there are many aspects of religious beliefs which pastors might explain to people in sermons, but which aren't explained to people whom um, like these believers are trying to be true, right? Immediately, because you want to have as many people to join your, your religion or join your church as fast as possible, and that's why you think it's impossible for you to explain like the entire Bible to them. Who's going to listen to you and when you're talking about like Bible or theological teachings? Who's going to listen to you? Instead, they're only going to listen to you when you, when you bring up like miracles and say like this happened, right? In order to like capture people's attention. But this is ultimately harmful because there's been an over-reliance on this entire aspect of preaching, right? And it is especially harmful when like it might be harder for people to come to come to come to come to come to the kind of religion they have ultimately opted into. They are wondering why isn't there all these miracles that were promised for me? They might be clutching at straws and trying to um, try to interpret many different signs as what ultimately as ultimately signs from God. And all this is especially important because sometimes for many religions it might be especially hard for them to pull out. We think that in the first place it is hard for, me, for them to make an informed choice. It is hard for them to ultimately come to terms and make a proper and rational choice at the end of the day. For all these reasons, we are very proud to propose. This house thanks him. We now let you introduce the lights of the day. Oh, 
your side. Really, number one, there are a lot of religious beliefs and teachings that this is something that is God's will. You're going to have to accept it at some point. But secondly, also, we think that these people will also then get and get all the benefits from religion in itself. A lot of benefits that are mutually exclusive when, uh, to our side, when you are people that don't want these people to enter these religions on the basis of emphasis. But moreover, we think that different people also relate to different religions differently. And this means that when we enter into these, into these things, even if they enter on the basis of all struggles and all kinds of things, because this particular God has these ultimate values and can actually do these miracles, and if the people believe so, then we think we're fine with that. But more so, when they enter into these situations and when they enter into all these things, we think that obviously the church has a big incentive to teach them these ultimate values because the church always has the role in teaching these people and educating them on the proper path. We think that they will teach these values also because they want to keep the church as big as it is already and they always want to have more and more people and more people continuously quitting the church. So we don't think that the church will ultimately just give them that and tell them you believe in this thing and okay, you just stay there and listen to my sermon. We don't think that's going to happen, right? But on the idea right. of competition and you know which miracle is more important, like uh, hello, obviously different miracles apply to me to people. That means if I am someone that is sick and I believe in divine healing, obviously if I believe that this God can cater to my divine healing, then what is how is that harmful? We think it's always right. about the believability of that particular religion to that person. We think it's fine in that way. But moreover, if a religion wants to be able to convince other people in different ways, we're yeah. fine with that. We don't think there's a particular harm towards that. But no, the, the second idea, the idea of joining cause immediately, and oh, oh how is man insisted? For this. We think that even if they, uh, they want to opt in in this city, we already tell you how it's going to be a long term benefit to us. So. But even if they back, we, uh, we, even if they don't recognize this problem, we think there will still always be benefits. And even if they don't understand at the first point that religion is all about teaching you on the continuity of that particular religion, we don't think it's ultimately harmful. But last idea who's going to listen to you if, if you only teach a uh, uh, preach about the Holy Bible and all those kinds of things? Then we believe that if that is the, the problem with that particular religion, what is the harm of them actually using this emphasis on all these kinds of things? Because we tell you that if people want to opt into it on the basis of that religion, we think it's fine. If they want to have a safety net and believe that ultimately that's the reason why I need a God and a supreme being watching over me, we don't think it's harm in that particular choice. Moving on to my uh, two arguments for today, but sure. The entire problem is when it is legitimate for people to say, I want to join a religion because you call me out my illness. But then, at the end of the day, it doesn't materialize, which is why it's bad. I it's told you life. already, we understand that it can be worse. But the hope that you hold on to when they are particularly, when, when they are at the point of, when they are dying of the situation, we think that hope is particularly important when we subscribe ourselves to a certain religion that will tell them that they will kill them. But even if it doesn't kill them, we told you that the benefits that are sued will only come on our side when you diminish the ability for the religion to cater towards these people. Let's understand what these miracles are because we think these miracles are defined proof of supreme being existing and it's a legitimate way because he never characterized to us what it is. Because we believe that what is the emphasis on the divine healing? These are things like surprising results and surprising accidents or things like divine healing or people that are missing that come reappearing. We think that these divine situations that occur regularly or in situations not so regularly occur to different kinds of people. See, and also these kinds of things are things that many scientists, many journalists, many doctors themselves cannot disprove. This means that these are the things that are not necessarily something that is, that is uh, ultimately not being able to happen, but it's something that's subjective and able to for everyone to ultimately rationalize and choose what you like to be in. We think that it's a, especially because it's not something that has ultimately been ruled out as harmful, we think that every church or religious body has the ability to use this to their benefit, to cater towards people. Because what is the role of the religion, we don't think the answer is special. Right? Because number one, it's to cater to people. Number two, to be able to help people to cling on to hope. And number three, to be able to teach them about doing social good and being a better person in the world. Right? We think that if they are able to do this the best purpose of religion, to keep to incentivize more people to join these kinds of things, we think it's particularly fine. Because number one, it fulfills the role that they have. But number two, we also be able to attract more followers. But how is it even better for people on this side? And what's the result of this emphasis? We think it's necessary for people to be able to opt into this idea that this God is particularly amazing. When you remove the ability for them to emphasize on this thing, you remove and devalue the entire religion to begin with. You devalue the entire reason for that God to exist. Because God in itself, for many people, has the, 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 they have to believe that this God is supernatural. And we think that this kind of supernatural emphasis is something that's important for people to cling on to in, the, in their respect to what they think God is. We think that this perception of what God is is particularly important to every kind of people out there and to those religious bodies themselves. This means that if people want to opt into this idea that they have a supreme God that can change their particular situation when they are sick, when 
Maintaining a balance between recruiting more individuals and individuals who were seen. The problem with such opposition was that their initial attack for policy was not one that already clashes with the idea that we don't want to emphasize on religion, but one that challenges whether this emphasis on religion will happen in the first place. Clearly, this debate must assume that the emphasis on religion does happen, and taking that as a fiat, how are we going to look at this debate? I'm going to look at it in two key areas. First, we're going to talk about the entire rhetoric about how you know, people are going to accept it in the long run and it's going to be beneficial in terms of recruiting more people. And second, we're going to talk about their whole idea of the relatability of miracles. So the first idea that they told us, right, they told us that people are going to accept it in the long run. In fact, their rhetoric was, you know, when you find out that this miracle won't happen to you, you are going to have to just accept it in future. We argue that that shouldn't be the case. Our argument of the first speaker, which he failed to deal with, was that it is important for people to understand the choices that they are making. Especially when religion pertains to your lifestyle, pertains to something that is so fundamental to what you believe. It's not just about people forcing you and realizing in the long run that you don't just suck it up, it's not going to happen to you. It's about realizing that this is what I want, this is the fundamental thing I want to subscribe to as a way of life, not just because I realize it doesn't happen, I'm just going to suck it up. In fact, it is this type of rhetoric that Timothy told you is particularly harmful. Because in instances where there is little recourse when you join the religion or little opt-out clauses from joining the religion, it is exactly that rhetoric that emphasizes it. When you say, wait, you join the religion because of miracles, it didn't happen, don't go up, just suck it up. Because that isn't going to happen, just accept it. It is that kind of rhetoric that keeps people perniciously within religions that they don't want to subscribe to, that we only enter because of shock and awe. Then they told us, you know, people will teach these values anyway. We already told you that there is a fear, and we must assume that religion is that, uh, miracles are the emphasis of this. But let us now give you the best case scenario that exists on the other side. What is the best case scenario? The best case scenario that exists on the other side, hold on a minute, sir, is that we have, you know, people come to churches and are willing to come to churches because we shock and awe them, and then we get to teach them these values. I'll show you why this is still fundamentally harmful, but before that, go. You can say by fear that emphasis of religion exists, uh, emphasis of miracles exists, but you cannot say by fear that there is no other content that is being teached within those religions that we expose the believers to and those other things as well. Yes, if you just heard my name, what I was exactly going to about that right now. So moving on to it. So first, we argue that you initially already turn away new recruits into the religion. Why so? Because the basis by which they joined the religion in the first place was because of the material presence of a higher being. It was because of these miracles that they saw happen. When God healed an individual, when God gave food to individuals, that is the basis by which they joined the religion. But when they entered the church and realized, hey, wait a minute, that isn't really the case. This is about faith, this is about belief, this is about a way of life. It is not about the miracles. If they want a better, like if they want both worlds, you argue they ultimately harm them in the long run, because these people are just going to say, this is not what I signed up for, they are going to be enemies. And that's why even in their best case scenario, it doesn't happen. But what did Timothy tell you that they failed to deal with? They failed to deal with the idea that there will be skeptics even before they can enter a church, which is very simply. If I hear about the religion, so if I hear about in Greece, God healed someone who had sickness, I'm not going to suddenly say, oh wow, God exists and therefore I will join Christianity. That just isn't going to happen. Intuitively, what will happen is that I'll be like, wait, is this actually true? Is this scientifically possible? As they already admitted, it is fundamentally impossible for these things to happen under our present scientific context, which turns many people away and make them skeptical of this religion in the first place. So even if they want to say they will teach them in church, many of these people don't go to church in the first place. Why is outside factor on this ground? Sure, we argue that some people won't want to subscribe to this way of life, and that will happen on both instances. But at the very least, 
The thing why it's fundamentally important is to give individuals who choose to subscribe to this religion an informed choice to allow them to make the decision as to whether they want to subscribe and want them to be a fundamental belief if they are to keep on for the rest of their lives. We I mean, this is a big decision, it's not something as simple as, you know, I just suddenly subscribe to it because of shock and awe, but it's a decision that is undermined on their side. Fundamentally, when they all characterize it as a single instance, a single moment, we think it's far more than that. But more than that, we argue that it's not just about teaching these values in church, or about just having these new people come to church in the first place. It is about the fundamental understanding of what this religion is. And here's where Timothy's analysis and their ability to do with it is fundamentally problematic. They told us, sure, we can allow people to continually believe it is about supernatural things. But we have to say, and we have to admit, that the physical presence of a higher being is often very rare. That's why we thought that miracles are happening day in and day out, it just doesn't happen. Insofar as that is the case, and insofar as that is that this supernatural or physical presence of God is what keeps people within the religion, we argue and say that in the long term, or even within a short span of time, people are going to be turned away if this physical presence doesn't manifest itself, if this doesn't happen. We argue that it's fundamentally the case, and they will turn people away or then have people join this religion in the long run. I'm not going to then look at the second idea that they talk to us about about the reliability of miracles. Right? And here's where they told us, oh, we need the ability rather, of miracles. And here's where they told us that each individual religion will have its own miracle, like specialization or whatnot. And people will buy into the religion that has a miracle in the, uh, that has that miracle that has key to step. My first speaker already told you why this is fundamentally harmful, insofar as you don't want people to buy the religion just because the religion offers them the help. Especially when their speaker wants to tell us that religion is for falling a social good, it's not about your own benefit. That's why we think that joining a religion because we think God can give you food or God can kill you is fundamentally in, in, not in line with the idea of a social good, the idea of propagating the beliefs of the religion. And it's contradictory on the other side to want to propose both solutions. But we argue that the combination idea that came out there at the end, we're at the end of this, is worse when they tell us that you know, people subscribe to religions on the basis of what miracles they have to offer. Timothy told you about how people just get bigger and more types of miracles that will happen. I'm going to argue that this causes religion to over exaggerate the key capabilities or what they can actually achieve. What happens, right? Because now these religions know that it is the specific type of miracle that will get me this miracle. That some people want healing powers, some people want God to give them food. And these are different kinds of miracles that currently exist. As they say, different religions have these different kinds of miracles or different kinds of miracles to offer. What we argue is that at the point in which this is the basis for new recruitment, at the point in which the emphasis on miracles is so great, people are just going to say, actually my God can do all of this, actually my God can achieve everything that you want in the other religions will come to me instead. Ultimately, we think this reads too hard. First, it reads the heart of conflict within religion, where religion try to overcompete with each other and try to steal recruits from other individuals because they think that these miracles are bound to happen. But second, also because that you know, many people see that these miracles won't happen, that they got doesn't actually offer them. In a long way, it is outside their recruits, more individuals and have individual recruits stay longer within these religions. They were very proud to stand in proposition. This house, thanks, Brian, for coming to introduce Evan to the floor. On miracles does not mean a dismissal of all other canons of religion. And they already agreed and conceded to that. So we also agree that the church is not only about gaining more believers, but also making sure the believers stay. So how do we tackle certain rebuts? So the points coming up from their side of house. We tackle it in a few ways, right? First thing they told you this idea, well, it's important to make people understand the choices they're making, because it's a big choice. And by emphasizing just the main part of miracles, then you don't allow them uh, the exposure to all other canons of the religion themselves. Look, when, let's characterize the moment that individuals face the proselytization. What really happens, right? When the moment individuals face proselytization, they enter religion based on consent and informed choice. Why is this so, right? We think these people are also sufficiently exposed to the idea that miracles could potentially fail as well. And emphasis on miracles by, uh, by the religious groups does not mean 
we see what are exposed to the media and things like that, where certain miracles that you just propagated them did fail. So we think that they enter based on consent, on consent and from choice as well. But furthermore, we argue even further than that, right? They only enter when they believe the miracle is relatable to them. So we dismiss this idea that in the future, these individuals may care about that should they are like, not exposed to the idea of faith and all those things. But when they enter, they enter based on relatability. And this is something they never got at the end of the day, right? Because at the end of the day, my, my religion and what I believe at the end of the day is based on how I understand my religion. If I understand my religion based on miracles and based on what happens, miracles to other people, or miracles that could potentially happen to myself, it's a consent, consensual choice that I make, it's a form choice that I make that I end the religion based on this thing potentially happening to me. And we don't think that's a form of coercion. We think that people do understand the choices I'm making because they are related and they relate to the idea that miracles could potentially happen to them in a very unique way. Then secondly, the second speaker told you, right, the relatability of miracles and how it's harmful because the religion should not only be about your own benefit, it should be about altruism and things like that. So, people join churches and remain there because also they want to achieve certain form of personal benefits and personal gains as well. You cannot dismiss this idea, right? People remain in religion because they understand I'll have eternal life, not other people, under those circumstances, I'll get benefits in the real world, right? But furthermore than that, just because you emphasize the miracles doesn't mean miracles don't only occur to you. Emphasis on miracles also means that you believe that other people could experience miracles as well. That's why people form prayer groups and pray for miracles to happen to other people. Those are forms of social goods and altruism that your religion also and our religion can also provide under this circumstance. Then you throw this weird idea from the second speaker. People overcompete. Overcompetition happens under status quo as well. We don't see why it's uniquely, mutually exclusive towards outside, right? We feel the religious organization always want more believers under all circumstances, right? They can use all the various types of methods unless there's third party harm to expose people to their religion and convince people to join their religion, right? So we tell you that exposing people to emphasis of miracles is a legitimate tactic for churches or religious organizations to expose people and gain, gain more believers, right? We don't see why overcompetition is a bad thing under your side, right? Or under our side as well. So let's tackle a few things that came out from Prime Minister as well. He told you about the response of non-believers and told you, oh, these things are not science-based, are, are things out of logic. It's exactly that, right? We think atheists and non-believers are inquisitive individuals. These are people who try to fill the logic gap. Things that people can, that things that the real world cannot, uh, the, uh, the answer in the real world that currently exists cannot provide. That's when religion comes into step, step in and fills that gap for them. This is they understand that religion is something special, right? Religion is something that fulfills the answers which the world cannot explain in the school today, and it's something sufficiently and uniquely important and relatable to every individual, not only myself as a non-believer, but to other people who are believers as well. No, I think I'm after my rebuttals. Then you go about new believers and they join churches based on the idea that God performs miracles, and once they realize that the church does not base their teachings upon the idea that churches uh, that, that miracles do happen, then they leave and things like that, right? We allow churches to employ various tactics to attract miracles to come, uh, to attract believers to come in, right? We have soup kitchens, right? Where people come, where poor people come in and eat, but at the other end of the room, people are singing kumbaya, praying to their God and things like that, right? And, and having, having teachings or, or personal teachings of their religion, things like that, right? These are choices that churches, these are tactics that churches do make in order to gain more believers and gain and attract more believers into their churches. But they are not, they are not against that. Why is this so? Because we think that under both sides, the principle is this, right? In order to gain more believers, we can do whatever we want, but the idea is sustainability, right? And the idea of sustainability is that we can add that for once we attract their attention, we expose them to the real teaching, right? As long as there's sufficient curiosity to make them sustainable at the end of the day, then we think that we can build upon that curiosity and fill in the logic gaps that religion provides, and fill in the answers that the real world cannot provide, and allow these people to experience God in a way that's personal to them and intrinsic and intimate and relatable to them. I'll take one, yeah. So people want answers and promises of the supernatural. And when you go in, you tell them that the real answer is that your faith is not strong enough. Maybe God knows better that like all the things that we told you might not materialize because actually you know what? Just be a while more, need to wait a while more. Yeah. So that side assumes that a miracle will never happen, right? We say that miracles can potentially happen as well and the faith can still exist on the outside. But even if the miracle does not happen, right? We think that individuals raise their faith on relatability, right? If these individuals enter the religion because they are relatable to miracles, not only miracles happen towards themselves, but miracles that happen towards other people as well, and the, and the form of the form of personalization that occurs towards other people and the way miracles expand themselves and, and translate themselves towards interpreting, interpreting religion towards 
other individuals, then we think that they will remain in the region even if the miracles that some occurred there. Because they see miracles still happening to other individuals, even if it don't happen to us as well. They still see that miracles are something true. The required region for me when they expose me to miracles is still something true because it still happens to other people even though it doesn't happen to me. That's something that they need to understand from their side of the house. So what's my argument for today? It's the subjective relatability of religion and why churches or religious organizations should be allowed to employ this method, right? To gain more believers and make that sustain, right? So we have to argue this, right? Different people opt into religion and stay in religion based on the relatability of their teachings. That's why religion is a personal relationship with God. So the way you relate your, to your God may be different from the way I relate to my God. So religion intends to maximize its relatability to individuals to allow them to effectively translate the Holy Scripture to a message that's understandable and relatable towards the congregation. How is this related to this debate, right? We think that emphasis of miracles allows maximization of relatability and maximization of sustainability of individuals within the church itself. How is this so, right? We think firstly, miracles provide answers to the un 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 unanswerable questions that exist within the status quo today, right? Because humans are naturally inquisitive and curious individuals, often there's a vast amount of ambiguity that exists within this world that logic cannot fulfill, that logic cannot answer. So in a quest to fulfill the logical gap, individuals opt into religion to add up into the idea that miracles exist to fulfill that logical gap, to pro so that religion provides answers towards that logical gap, right? These are things that exist, and these are, things, these are reasons why people stay in religion, right? Because they are, they, they are still curious about how certain things occur, and why they occur, right? And they believe that religion provides the answers towards that. But furthermore, things which come up from our time, Mr. Stich, which, which was unimportant, right? It provides a safety net, right? Where individuals believe that health is the most important thing at the end of the day, and I believe that miracles allows me to preserve my health, even though it could may not potentially happen to me, but I believe that in the potential that it, miracles may happen to me, one day when I'm in a dire state of class and I need this is why individuals opt in to have a safety net to preserve their life and they we can this way. This house, thanks Kevin, I would now like to introduce Katie Rosen as well. Let's ask two questions. First, let's ask, does this allow religious communities to retain membership? And talking about more open-minded people. Second, let's ask if this helps them better recruit membership. Talking about more skeptical people like debaters ourselves. First question, does this help them re um, retain membership? Right? And there was no analysis whatsoever on the other side of the house about how people join religion. Right? Their characterization was that there was no incentive on the part of religions to recruit people immediately because they want to retain these people. That's true. We agree, and it is always in the interest of religious communities who want to retain membership. But here's the problem. The sort of rhetoric they bank on to capture the attention of the public is ultimately counterproductive. Why? And here's why I extend our analysis. Because God is immaterial. Because it is very easy for them to use a physical manifestation of God, i.e. miracles, to allow the public to cling on to these beliefs, saying that God can do this for you if you choose to believe in this religion. But this sort of rhetoric is often being counterproductive because it means that people always have to see a physical manifestation of God before they truly believe that God yeah. exists. Oh, well, thank you. But then they said, oh, but these religions, oh, sorry, but these miracles exist, and you know, like, um, and that these miracles are true. Here's what we say we never impose a value judgment on what religion is or whether or not these miracles will happen. But the problem is this there's mutual exclusivity insofar as religionists and pastors choose to foreground miracles as a means and as a rhetoric to capture the attention and therefore giving more enough emphasis on other parts of religion, an argument I'll be forwarding later. So given this understanding, how does this affect a person on the ground, right? We recognize that different people have different motivations for joining our religion. But the problem is this, at the point where the membership is hinged on the miracle that by definition hardly ever happens, there are few problems. One, sorry, two problems. Um, one of two problems. One, this causes them to feel extremely guilty because the rhetoric that miracles are not happening because you don't believe in God strongly enough causes them to feel guilty and shameful about their personal beliefs. Or, secondly, this causes them to disappointment because at the point where I choose to believe in a religion, I choose to offer my fundamental beliefs for someone where it doesn't materialize, this only causes disappointment. 
They said, but miracles happen, guys. You cannot say that miracles don't happen. So this must affirm that release, because if miracles happen, this will affirm that release. We argue that only one of these two scenarios will occur. Either one, miracles by definition are hard to occur or hardly occur, therefore they have to wait even longer. Or two, it is very easy for pastors to attribute cause and effect of a particular scenario or particular instance to God, and thereby say that this is a miracle. What is the harm of this? This causes individuals to lose the freedom of choice, to lose the freedom to truly believe in the religion, because not any particular instance can be used by a pastor to materialize and to actually um, shut them out altogether, and there's no other cause, and this only causes further damage. What do we want on our side house? We want people to enter religion with realistic expectations, um, with, with realistic expectations about what religion is. We don't want the rhetoric that religion or that God is a miracle worker. Rather, we want religion to be what it is, to be something about faith, something about waiting and years of membership and years of believing in God. And this is why, Sir. thank you, by not basing an early emphasis on miracles, we truly allow informed choice. And this following reply also rebuts the second speaker argument, right? Because they said that this was about consent. Like, obviously, people consent very easily, especially since pastors can very easily attribute something as a miracle when it might not be. We need to bring nicely to my second question. Whether that's not a house, whether that allows for the recruitment of membership. And here's uh, a uh, uh, yeah, before I go for yes. Considering we already have things like indoctrination since childhood, school teachers, adoption agencies, and preaching to the indigenous cultures, how are you? How are these churches already upholding the idea of informed choice on your side? I don't get that because, I mean, if on one hand, these people are indoctrinating their children to believe in a religion, that by that, um, that from them, the rhetoric that you believe in God because miracles happen is ingrained in the mindset, then we don't see how there's any freedom of choice. More importantly, we have to understand society's frame of mind. We have to understand that in the status quo, we are affected by, for instance, the Enlightenment era or the scientific method of cause and effect. It is not particularly persuasive to the most skeptical of people that something happened 40,000 years ago to Jonas and the whale can get spit out is something that's really persuasive. Especially, one, because this is the frame of mind, and two, because these are fundamental beliefs people are skeptical about. Because these are fundamental beliefs which they have to consider and ponder over before truly believing uh, you know, in these religions. But listen to the average reasonable person we don't think this is something that is particularly persuasive. They say, oh, religion fills in the gap of logic. But like, here's the problem, right? If it is hard for logicians and hard for the average reasonable person to not understand why love happens, it doesn't mean immediately that they will um, be inclined towards another explanation. Just because something is not the case, that doesn't thank you, mean that the other explanation is true. And this is the sort of criticism which Richard Dawkins has used against religion. Because the choice of religion, as he says, is that science cannot prove something, but as he says, this does not mean that religion can prove this. What does this mean? This opens up religion to criticism from logicians because what is more truly appealing is to see what happens and what is more persuasive, no thank you, within the status quo. Because with this frame of mind, it's like, um, it is extremely hard for people to believe in something that is a miracle. More importantly, and here's what they never about them, we argue that this causes them to over-exaggerate miracles. For the very simple reason that now, knowing that these are, um, knowing that these are the weakest points in individuals, and knowing that these miracles are what causes or might cause individuals to be swayed over to the downside of the house, this causes them to manipulate these three points by commonly throwing out the rhetoric about how this helps with health, how this helps with money, especially since you know these are things that people cling on very easily to, or you know, maybe um, maybe the more greedy ones, right? So what the what happens is that if they want to say that people only enter these religions because miracles are related to them, then this is the precise logic of trying to explain. But trying to demonstrate that what these religions do is that they use specific miracles in particular areas, for instance, health, for instance, money, to win over the hearts of these people. But this is pernicious insofar as this harms the freedom of choice, an argument and the core argument of our side of house. What am I showing today? Firstly, it may be true that this is the incentive of religionists, but this is ultimately counterproductive because it causes membership to be hinged upon miracles and it can only be for miracles. More importantly, this will already cause one of two scenarios, either to be too guilty to believe in religion or to cause disappointment, and we shut out like, um, and we shut out by religious communities all together. For these reasons, this motion must stand. This sounds thanks, Gabriel, and now for the last constructive round of the speech of this year's ASDC Deborah. <laughs>
tried to reframe the debate and tell you that the most important part of this debate is that people have a choice. When Eliza already PY to you that the state never takes into account necessarily free choice when it comes to things like religion. That's why we allow indoctrination from young, that's why we allow people to um, facilitize even to indigenous tribes that may not even have access to any other forms of religion. Yeah. Why does the state allow this? Because we understand that any religion on its own has a benefit for people. Whatever it is that it teaches, usually the collective morality is something that benefits people, it's something that makes people want to be better on their own. Considering all of this, we think that a large chunk of the speech of why there's no choice at all is rendered irrelevant. There's basically one issue in this debate today. How do you improve the spreading of religion and religion in itself? Because they basically told us four things. First, that it undermines, uh, that it undermines the new believers' belief, acceptance, and that people will leave because they don't know enough. We don't think that's true, right? Because it's an assumption that miracles will not happen and somehow people will be disappointed and leave. We think that miracles are very likely to happen. That's why there's so much talk about it. That's why so many pastors preach about it, right? But even if these miracles do not happen, we think that the benefit on our side is that it's a curiosity that is built on people who are on the fence or even the skeptics that they wanted to talk about. Because even if they have uh, experienced that kind of miracle, they still want to know why did this miracle happen. And that's something that's beneficial for religion, right? When people want to know more and religion is forced to rationalize the kinds of things that they do and teach them you know, the kinds of beliefs that they have. But what was the second, uh, what was, but more than that, we think that um, the priority of religion is not simply no. to gain numbers, right? it's, to, it's to gain numbers sustainably. That's why we have incentive not to simply bring them to church and leave them at the side, think, making them think that miracles are the only tenet of religion. That's something that everyone yeah. built up can believe upon. Because for saying that religion wants people to come and believe that things clearly, they're going to want to teach them about the other things that they believe in too, right? Not simply just that miracles are God, but that miracles are an effect of our God and our God does these particular things. What was the second thing that they tried to tell us? They told us that there was a competition of religion and that you promote exaggeration or a bit of a a rehash happened in DPM. We don't think that it's likely that they'll be exaggerating no. anyway, right? Because the competition that they talk about already exists. It's more likely that they have no incentive to exaggerate because firstly, it's not relatable to the people who they want to tell this to, but more than that, it, it, it would then be untrue, right? And these religions uh, generally teach people not to lie. And it's worse if they are found out to have been lying because then there's even more backlash, they are rendered even more invalid in yeah. society. That's why they couldn't simply uh, exaggerate. Right? But what's the third idea that came to them, uh, that, that came up? They told us that there was coercion that happened and somehow people wouldn't be able to choose. Here are three pillars of what a rational choice is. First, you're able to opt out. We think it's very easy for people to opt out of religion. They can choose to be in a religion, to be not in a religion, make up their own religion even if they want it. Second, there needs to be a plethora of choices which they do have, right? And thirdly, they need to be informed of the decisions that they make. We think that considering there's already so many counter-narratives to religion, there's already so many people, atheists or scientists who say religion is untrue and here's why. This is this is exactly why we need this kind of counter-narrative, things like miracles, tangible proofs of this religion, we will successfully counter this. Because how long can a religion stand if they don't have anything tangible to back them up? What was the fourth idea that they gave to us? They talked to us about how there's skepticism that happens, and even if you had miracles, you never bring anyone to church. But look, Eliza told you specifically from the beginning that this debate is about those who are, you know, on the fence, who can change and who we need to change. But even so, we think that the, that the benefit on our side is at least a kind of curiosity that happens there. At least we can change those, at least we can change them. At least now, we are highlighting I think that the inability to understand these certain things is what's going to make them want to find out more. But even if we never change them, they will never change in the first place. Because from the PM themselves, they say, who wants to listen to the Bible? Who wants to listen to a you know, preacher anyway? At least in our side, we make people want to learn, even if they don't say, at least we've made a bigger uh, choice, at least we've made a bigger try. Yes. It is about choosing between either my way of life and my belief, or on your side, scientifically impossible miracles. We argue that your side turns people away insofar as you don't promote religion as something that I believe is as my way of life. If they don't believe in it intrinsically, they wouldn't subscribe to it. This is not people who want to anyway. But even if you want to talk about scientific proof, there's a lot of things that people accept, right? Things like the placebo effect. You can't explain the things that 
your body does, but you still accept it, right? See, science explains it. Considering that, therefore, your scientific explanation is not always the core of every single belief, let's take a look at what we talk to you about. Because why are miracles so necessary? It's for people to make that conceptualization of what God is. Because that's what religion is. It's not supposed, it's not about this whole body of a church. It's about me and God. It's about the way that I can commune with God. And if the way that miracles does it is kickstart that relationship or, or even strengthen the kind of relationship that people have when they see that they were that they were in a, that they were in a car accident and they still managed to make it out alive. This is the kind of thing that strengthens these relationships with God and that's what makes it so necessary. It allows them to further in fact the understanding of God, to create that understanding, to make them want to look even more into what God is, especially those people right, who are let's say uh, you know on the fence or about to leave their religion when they find these kinds of things that can back them up, that's something that's good, right? Because it, it's like a physical manifestation of God that improves the that, that? kind of um, the kind of intimacy that they can have with him. But more than that, we think the government side never really gives to us any kind of benefit, right? Because even though they conceded, you know, that not many people want to listen to religion, even if they want to stick with their whole idea of pure doctrine, let's tell everybody everything about the Bible before we ask them whether they want to be Christian, they're still not giving us any benefit, even though they agree that the that what we all want is to be able to spread religion better. We already told you why there's incentive to spread this religion better. We don't think that we've heard any real response to that. Because more than that, we told you that uh, uh, what I ever talked to you about was that we need to maximize the relatability and the sustainability of these different religions, right? And the reason why people need miracles is because they are the answer to ambiguous questions that we've had for centuries or even just, you know, for our whole lives, right? Considering, considering this then, we think that it's more likely that we're able to answer the questions that people have through divine means, right? Because this is the only thing that can really explain it. Because let's compare what happens here. Is it more likely that religion will simply talk about their talk about the miracles and not follow up on their religion on the religious followers and leave them to let's say leave the faith once and they realize that, that, that a miracle isn't going to happen? Or is it more likely in our side that they want to make the faith in those people sustainable, that they want to make sure that these people understand the other tenets of religion and not simply think, you know, this God is about miracles, but rather that this God works miracles because of the different things that he is. At the end of the day, we are the only side that brought you a benefit. They never do. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, the reply speech from side opposition, may we have Emma Wong. Can you guys please not disturb the debate? Thank you. Let's follow the two clashes Government Big provided to you in his own speech and tell you how he didn't fulfill those two clashes and those two issues under his own side in today's debate. The first is Catholic's weird UI coming in Deborah's speech from their side, but the idea that first is either a choice between you have your own conception of God, your own relationship with God, or you choose to believe in a miracle. We think at the very first place, if you were to opt in into the religion based on the emphasis of miracles, you believe that you relate to God based on miracles themselves. So we don't understand why it harms your own perception on, on your own relatability to God if your own relatability to God was based on the emphasis of miracles to begin with. So if it wasn't, then you wouldn't have opted in in the first place. We don't think that's a main issue to discuss. But let's go into the two issues which he himself said. Firstly, about recruitment, and secondly, why people would want to stay in religion. About recruitment, firstly, they said on their side, they said when recruitment happens on the basis of miracles, three things happen. Number one, individuals don't get informed choice. Number two, miracles, know, which are under their side, not the main tenet undermine the other core tenets of religion, and thirdly, comes an individual relationship with God, which I do really understand under their side, right? Look how we tackle those ideas, right? Firstly, we told you that it was an informed choice, right? Because people firstly could opt out at any point of time, but secondly, they encounter various counter-narratives towards the narratives proposed by religion itself, through the media, through, uh, through atheists or skeptics, which they wanted to provide as well under their case, right? So people can opt out and opt in based on informed choice in the very first place. But even if it was an informed choice, religion always proselytizes based on certain coercive ex aspects to begin with. Like, like what Eliza and Deborah particularly pointed out to you, they proselytize through soup kitchens, proselytize through 
indoctrination to indigenous communities, they put that type of indoctrination to families, things down, right? I think these are things that happen which have certain coercive aspects, but they are okay with it, right? So you don't see why informed choice is a main clash with this game. Secondly, miracles are not the main talent and undermines other core talents of religion. We told you that religion, there's no such thing as core talents or not core talents. It's all about relatability and how you relate to the religion and how you relate to God, to the certain things proposed by the religious organizations to begin with. We told you from the very get go, if miracles weren't relatable to you to begin with, you wouldn't have opted in. Because miracles were relatable to you, you therefore opted in, you therefore made it a core talent of your own belief towards God. I think that's crucial to, uh, to allow to continue to exist in today's society, where individuals who do believe miracles do exist and miracles do happen to allow continue to spread that belief to other individuals as well. We think that's something that they undermine in their side because there's no such thing as a core tenant or not core tenant. Um, plus, there is this idea that you have individual relationship with God. We don't think this is true. We think it maximizes the relatability of God. Something in my speech that was left untouched by Esther, right? When you allow emphasis on miracles, when you allow miracles to fill, to, to fill in the logic gaps that happens under the status quo today, then you allow them to have better relationship and understanding with God when God provides the answers to the questions that exist in today's world, when they can fulfill the inquisitive and curious nature under many circumstances in this world. So we think that recruitment happens better on the outside and it's undermined under the outside when the first speaker already admitted that the only they're going to check people to boring long sermons and the right pastor on their side. Let's tackle the other main harm which they propose, right? Why do people stay in religion? They say that you fall out of religion, right? Look, so that's a, firstly a main assumption on their side that miracles will not happen. Because on the outside, we know that miracles could potentially happen and you must allow individuals to continue to believe that miracles could happen. But let's tackle the main clash then, of this case, right? What if miracles do not happen? Then we came out for you, there's disappointment, guilt and shame and things like that, right? Look, if miracles do not happen, but you entered religion based on the emphasis of miracles, this is why you allow miracles to fill, to fill in the curiosity within. This means that individuals are curious in nature, something I pointed out in my speech, and you allow religion to build on the curious nature of these things, right? That's why people still want to stay in religion, even though miracles don't happen, right? People say, hey, uh, there's so many other things within religion which fills answers that today's world do not provide. These are answers which I want to find, and religion is the only one which provides the answer to me. That's why people still have incentive to remain. But Furthermore, miracles not only need to happen towards yourself, but it can happen to other people. And that's a tangible proof that miracles still can happen, and you will see by yourself miracles do happen, and you continue to believe that miracles, although don't happen to yourself, that miracles do exist, and therefore you should stay in church because that's the cause and of your belief. You can still pray for miracles, you can still pray for things to happen to other people. We think that religion is better than on the outside. We have better recruitment, people will still stay in the church outside. We fulfill the two passions which they didn't fulfill. Thanks, Evan. For the last speech of this year's ASDC, we have Timothy on. You see, we cannot let opposition get away with mischaracterizing this entire debate. Because this debate was about specific religions which exist and which are trying to reach out to more people, not just any religion which is just based solely on miracles. This debate was not about banning these religions, but because precisely because of the huge ambiguity that exists, but about the harms that are accrued when all these religions ultimately exaggerate whatever miracles that are happening or try to focus and foreground on these miracles. We never said that you know, we never stood for any other form of indoctrination as just I did and just I tried to extend the principle. We on our side stood very clearly for the freedom of choice. And within this context, let us examine the different people who approach and who are approached by, the, by, by these creatures, right? So first of all, we talked about the scientific and inquisitive person who, was, who is increasingly prevalent in today's world, right? Because we all like have an inquisitive mind, etc. And just as we told you that foregrounding miracles will cause people to reject this religion out of hand, even before you talk about the other aspects of it, because you know there isn't people don't even um, people don't even consider that these miracles are like, scientifically possible to begin with, right? This is so harmful on their side when they refuse to engage with it, because any form of hope that they want to talk about, any form of choice that they want to talk about, is therefore non-existent on their side of the house. None of the benefits that they talk about through in the first place, the entire process is broken in the very first place. Then let's talk about the next aspect of the process, right? About people who want miracles for themselves. 
Here's what we call you that these people like say I'm sick and I want to be cured, right? I want a miracle from God. I'm not making an informed choice at the point where you tell me that these miracles are going to exist, this is God of miracles, and in fact, once you are going, you are living a terrible life because your pastor tells you maybe your faith is not strong enough, maybe you are guilty, maybe you are sinful, right? And there's a huge stigma that is associated with them when you're in the church. This is a terrible life, a terrible choice that you want these people, that you don't want these people to opt in for. Then you come towards the next entire idea, the next step. Uh, people who just believe in miracles in general, right? But they've really taken a two point, so like this is actually in fact above and beyond that. So here's where we tell you that religion is really so much more. Religion is about like faith, etc. All these are things which they consider, right? Like going to church, all the religious practice requirements, these are things which they concede. And at the point where they concede this, they need to show us why a person who believes that, that religion is about miracles should ultimately opt into a religion which foregrounds miracles while at the same time telling you that you're opting in for all these other requirements as well, something that just like has fundamentally failed to prove in this entire debate. Even for those people who want miracles and who opt into, who opt into religions who ultimately go for miracles, right? The problem with foregrounding the uh, foregrounding miracles in our uh, Protestantism is that ultimately this approach opens up religious beliefs to their entire scientific criticism, the entire uh, notion propounded by Richard Dawkins, where like you know, if science, even if science can't prove this, God can prove this either. Something uh, we clearly responded to, not dealt with by their side of the house. And you know the day, why then is their belief, why is then is their approach so important and reality, right? Because what? Like it gives them attention, because it's relatable, it captures people's attention. Here we really very clearly told you that more isn't better, right? And therefore, it is about the quality, it's about the nature of what people believe in it. Clearly, uh, if attention gets like more believers and more people to like get uh, like get done that get, get, get us attention of more people, that's not in and of itself a good because our point then falls when they concede that more isn't better. And finally, we also told you that this entire idea of sustainability is so harmful and pernicious, especially on our side of the house, right? Because in order to keep these people in, you fall out religion. Uh, you fall on miracles, sorry, in order to get them into the church in the first place. And once they're in the church, you constantly rationalize the entire thing to them. You use, you utilize the ambiguity and in the sermon, you constantly rationalize whatever's happening, and that is when there's ultimately no informed choice, there's ultimately no opt out at the end of the day. Members of this house, we think that people do not even have a choice to begin with. We think that people do not have a choice to go for the religion that they want to. There's no religious freedom of their side of the house. We clearly get to this today.